now the shoot had snapped into a steady rhythm, and my camera and I had become a part of the framework. I was documenting a brief period of separation from my normal life, just as many of those around me will quit the business after a year or so and return to their lives. But what interests me most is those who really feel a sense of belonging to this kind of existence. At 31, Jean is considered to be a success story. Through the business, she supports her family and has her future planned out in detail, including a continuing plastic surgery schedule. But at the time she entered the business, she seemed to be following a certain path rather than leading. In my interest with sex, it started at a very, very early age, and, uh, and I think it was just a natural progression for me to do this because it was easy and it was something I was good at, and uh, it really it had very little to do with the physical sex. As I got to know Gina better during the course of the shoot, I finally learned what everyone on the crew and anyone else who had been in the industry about five years ago already knew. Gina had had quite a turbulent past in the business. We'd gone out for a bite to eat in between scenes when she brought it up. So I had just woke up one day, virtually, and said to my boyfriend, I'm going to go shoot to bring him, and I'm going to become a jockey and lose everything that we have. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Sometimes I think, I think I just wanted to end it all. I think I just wanted to find out who was really my friend. Gina and her boyfriend at the time developed quite a nasty heroin habit. And after a while, when they were homeless and she couldn't work to support them, she decided to leave him in Hollywood and go away to get clean. He eventually ended up in jail. Two years later, she felt safe entering the business again, having a husband and child to support, as well as to motivate her to stay off drugs. Things had been going pretty smoothly so far, but on our second to last day, Gina heard that her ex-boyfriend had just gotten out of jail, and that he was in Hollywood looking for her. I left him right in this 10 block radius. After that, things just started going wrong. The next setup took place in a hotel in the same 10 block radius, where Gina would also spend the night since she lives in San Diego. The prospect of her junkie ex-boyfriend being in the vicinity seemed to have changed her mood quite a bit, and she was eager to get done with the scene. 10.30, oh my god. Look at me, look at me. Yeah, yeah, you're, now you're in pain. I mean, you're, you're, you're anxious. Don't make the sound of it's comfortable. Tensions began flaring everywhere. We eventually got through the scene, but Gina seemed to have almost turned into a different person. We left her at the hotel around midnight. I wondered if maybe some part of Gina wanted to see her ex-boyfriend. He seemed to represent the escape of her past life. Hey, Hollywood. I was homeless on those streets, you know, well, strung out, but, uh, <coughs> having to get hold of people to, you know, give me another 60 bucks so I could buy a 40 and 20 on a fucking roach motel. When we found Gina the next day, she was three hours late and in bad shape. All we knew for sure was she had run into her ex-boyfriend at some point, and he'd offered her heroin. As we drove between locations, I tried to tactfully figure out if she had simply slipped and let her addiction take over again. These things are always nice, warm, and fuzzy when you're on heroin, you know? Nothing really bothered you. As long as you were high, you could handle anything. It's harder to deal with life. After we finished our final few shots, Jeff seemed much more relaxed now that we were done. Gina slept in the back of the van, exhausted. She still wouldn't tell me exactly what had happened, 
or whatever it was, seeing her ex-boyfriend seemed to have jarred her out of the state of mind she was in the night before. He's never gonna learn, he's gonna die. So it's kind of... After the shoot, she was like a different person. She told me she'd begun to blame her mother's neglect for many of her problems in life. I know I could be anything, anything that I wanted to be, you know, but I just feel like, you know, after 10 years, this is my lot in life, basically. You know. It's a bad thing that you're doing? No, I don't think it's a bad thing. Not bad at all. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that if I had been given some self-esteem and some uh, guidance as a child, that I might have actually picked a career. Having said that, we went inside, where Gina proceeded to tell me that she no longer thinks HIV is sexually transmitted. I'm in the highest risk category. I was an IV drug user, I had multiple partners, I don't use condoms. Nobody in our business has died. And that she regularly has sex with her fans for money. It's a thousand dollars, fifteen for some, depending on what kind of watch they're wearing. <laughs> it, you know, like I said, they're not just buying a horn, they're buying an experience. And they will die with a smile because they know that they had sex with being fine. As I said goodbye to Gina for the last time, she gave me a big hug and told me not to worry about how I portrayed her. She just wanted me to be successful with my film. I really hoped she would be able to stay straight, despite all the potential chaos in her life. Since the time of our last interview, Gina has stayed in the business and kept her family together. She also moonlights at Larry Flint Publications, answering reader questions in Hustler Magazine. Braxton is now five years old. Jeff Coldwater started production on his first R-rated 16mm feature film in 1998.